Welcome to the Adventure Creator First Person Primer Tutorial. My name is Chris and I'm going to be covering how to create a first person adventure game using Unity 2020.3 and Adventure Creator version 1.74.2. I'm starting here with a fresh Unity project into which I've imported Adventure Creator from the Asset Store as well as this Morgue Room PBR asset which is a free asset on the Asset Store by Roque 3 d and if I go into the Morgue Scene folder, you'll see that we've got this single room here that's got good detail for a first-person game and quite a few interesting things that we can, uh, we can have the player interact with as part of our game. You don't need to be using this asset specifically. I'll try to keep this tutorial as open and general as I can. But if you want to follow along exactly, I'll put a link to this asset in the description below. And if you have questions or need help with anything, please ask on the Adventure Creator forum at adventurecreator.org slash forum. And I'll put a link to that in the description as well. To begin making a game using Adventure Creator, we need to run the new game wizard to create ourselves a set of manager assets. We can do that by going to the top toolbar and choosing Adventure Creator, getting started, and then new game wizard. And this is just a simple dialog box that allows us to type in some basic settings for our game. Our first is going to be game name, so I'll just be very interesting and call it My Cool Game. Choosing next our camera perspective, I'm going to set to 3D, and then we'll have a drop down for the kind of movement we want, and I'm going to make it first person. Next again, we have our interface, which is basically how we interact with hotspots. I'm going to leave it as context sensitive, which refers to a one button interface. So just clicking a mouse on a hotspot will interact with it. On the next page, we'll have our GUI system, which refers to how our game's interface is. I'm going to set this to default Unity UI, which means we'll have a default interface set up using Unity's own UI system. Finally, we'll have a page to confirm all of our choices. These are all fine, although we can change any of this later. So I'll choose finish, and after a few moments, these managers would have been created. And we get a message asking us if we want to uh, organize our scene. I'm going to choose no because I want to make a couple more changes to our scene. You'll also see that this AC game editor window has popped up. So I'm going to dock this uh, beside my inspector here. Coming back to our morgue scene. As part of this tutorial, I'm going to be covering how to switch scene. So I'm going to turn this into two scenes. You can see over behind this door here, we have this, this corridor area. So what I'm going to do is split this into um, the main room here and this corridor as two separate scenes. If you're following along with your own set of assets, you don't need to do this. Just have a pair of scenes that you want to feature in your game. Now you can see after using the new game wizard, we've got this My Cool Game folder in our project window. So I'm going to save a copy of this morgue scene inside that. I'm also going to save another copy and call it uh, Corridor. And in this Corridor scene, I'm going to just select all of these objects that are outside of it and delete them. I'll also go to File, Build Settings, and then add both of these scenes to my build settings. So if we now turn our attention back to AC's Scene Manager, you can see we've got an Organize Scene option. We can either do it with folders or without folders. Either's fine, it's really just a case of personal preference. I'm going to go with without folders just to um, keep the number of added game objects in our hierarchy to a minimum. And you can see we've now got a main camera, a game engine, which is what Adventure Creator needs to run, as well as this player start. And if I double click on it to view it in the scene window, you can see it's got this, uh, this blue arrow in the scene. This marks where the player begins if we run the game from this scene. So I'll just move it into, uh, into some empty space here. And you can see that this is assigned in our scene manager as the default player start. 
I'm going to just tidy up our hierarchy a little bit by right clicking and choosing Create Empty. I'll name it to say uh, Set. And I'll just move the graphical assets into it. For a first person game, we need to create a player character that is capable of moving in first person. The easiest way to do that is to use Adventure Creator's Character Wizard. And I can go to Adventure Creator, Editors, Character Wizard. Choosing Next, we'll just choose is this a player or an NPC? I'll choose Player and just Finish. And there we've got our player character ready to be controlled. If we run the scene, you'll see how this character works. Uh, we can't free aim yet, but we can uh, strafe and move forward and backwards by using the arrow keys. We've got a bit of head bobbing, and the camera is a bit low, making us feel like a bit of a kid. So I'm going to change all of those things one by one. In order to allow for free aiming, we first need to lock the cursor, which we can do by going to the Settings Manager. And underneath Interface Settings, I'll check Lock Cursor in Screen Center when the game begins. In order to then free aim, we need to assign inputs. If we scroll down to the Available Inputs section, you'll see that we have inputs named Cursor Horizontal and Cursor Vertical. And these are the axes used for first person free aiming. So we can go to Edit, Project Settings, and then Input Manager to create these axes. If we want to map these to the mouse, we can actually just take the default Mouse X and Mouse Y inputs and rename them. So I'll take mouse X and rename it to cursor horizontal. And I'll rename mouse Y to cursor vertical. And now I can free aim with the mouse cursor and move in all directions. But movement doesn't really feel too good. It's quite stiff um, and the, the head bobbing is pretty extreme. If we wanted to change those in this particular character, we can expand the player object, find the first person camera, and tweak some settings in the first person camera component. Another option is to go with the first person player template that we can get from Adventure Creator's downloads page. If we go to Adventure Creator, Online Resources, and then Downloads, we can find a selection of packages and templates that can be added on to Adventure Creator uh, straight away. So if I scroll down and I find Player Prefab First Person, I'll click to download it. And then back inside Unity, I'll go to Assets, Import Package, Custom Package, import this package. And we'll then find that inside our Adventure Creator folder, we've got Downloads and then First Person Player. And inside, we've got this First Person Player Prefab. So I'll drag this into the scene, remove our old player, and see how this behaves instead. This one is a little bit smoother. We've got some animation as we uh, move around the scene. Uh, we're still a little bit low, so let's come out of play mode and I'll select the first person camera child and set its position in the Y direction to about 1.9. If we select the root, we'll see that we rely on a character controller, which is now underneath the camera. So I'm just going to uh, raise its height to 2 and its center to 1, and that'll just keep the camera back inside the character controller. I also want to be able to run when we press the Shift button, and if we go back to the Settings Manager to check the Available Inputs window again, you can see that we've got a Run button available, so we can create an input named that to have our player run. Again, I'll go to Edit, Project Settings, I'll increase the size by 1, And I'll name this new one Run and set its positive button to Left Shift. So we can now move around the scene with the correct height. We can run. Um, if you find that the free aim is still a little bit stiff, we can lower the free aim acceleration in the movement settings. I'll try, say, about 30. And now we just want to go through the scene and check that all of our collisions are working. Um, if I walk into the table here, I'm finding that I can just clip through it. And I can also do the same thing if I come over to these drawers over here. So if I select the table first, go to its inspector, 
All I need to do is add a, uh, a box collider component. And I can do something similar for the drawers over here. Only each of these drawers is a prefab. So all of these are linking to the same prefab. So we can open up the original prefab. You can see we've got a mesh collider with no mesh attached. So I'll just remove this, go to the uh, corpse draw body object and add another box collider component in there. So let's just test. Uh, now we can no longer go through those drawers. Finally, I'm going to assign this first person player as our default. Uh, first, I'm going to create a new prefab out of this because we've changed it from the original. So I'll drag this into the My Cool Game folder, create an original prefab, and then going to my settings manager up at the top, we have this player prefab field. And if I drag this prefab into it, I can actually remove this from the scene and it'll be spawned in automatically. To make an opening cutscene, we can go to our scene manager and then under our list of scene cutscenes, I'll create a new on start cutscene. This appears in our hierarchy and if I click on this icon beside it, it'll bring up the visual scripting system, which we can use to create a simple cutscene. So this cutscene already has an engine wait action, which is the default type of action. I'm gonna give it a wait time of one second, and then I can create a new action by dragging out from this output socket. I want to have the player say something, so I'm going to set my action type to dialog play speech. I'm going to have the player character speak, so I'll check player line, and then I'll type in some text for him to say. We can test this by just running the scene. And you can see the text then appeared at the bottom as subtitle text. It also included the name of the player character, but we'll change that later on. For now, what we can do is make this cutscene a little bit more polished by relying on timeline to play some animation at the same time. Timeline is Unity's uh, sequencing tool and Adventure Creator has a number of custom tracks that can be used with it. I'll right click in the hierarchy and choose Create Empty and I'll make a new object called uh, Intro Timeline. In its inspector, I'll add the component Playable Director. And at the top, we have a playable asset field that we need to supply. As an asset, we need to create this in our project window. So I'll right click and choose Create Timeline. And I'll name this uh, Intro as well. If I select Intro Timeline and then assign this as the playable field, I can now double click on it to bring up the timeline window. I'll lock it and then we can begin creating our timeline. As part of this opening cutscene, I'm going to have the camera be on this table here and uh, have the, the player feel like they're waking up and then move off uh, onto the floor so that they can start walking around. To do that, I'm going to create a new camera. In my scene window, we have at the bottom a list of scene prefabs that we can add to the scene. And I'm going to add a simple camera, which is just a camera that won't move unless we animate it. So I'll click twice to create one, and I'll name this um, intro camera. And I don't have to, but I'll just, I'll parent it to my intro timeline to keep things tidy. I want to animate this as part of my timeline. So I'll drag it into my timeline window here and choose add animation track. And then I'll begin recording where I want it to be. So I'll start uh, with it um, kind of on the table here, facing a little bit downward. And I'll just animate it uh, moving up. Looking to the side. And then just tilting forward as the, uh, the player gets off the table uh, to a final position of around, around here. Let's just give it a quick preview.
and that's not looking too bad. So I'm going to reposition my player start so that it appears on the side of the table. And then what we need to do is have this timeline transition our camera from this intro camera to our first person player. Now, of course, we're only animating the camera here uh, and we're not actually telling it yet that we want this camera to be active, but we can do that using an Adventure Creator main camera track. So I'll right click and choose AC main camera track. And inside this, I'll create a add from camera, selecting the camera intro camera. And so for as long as this shot is active, this intro camera will be active. So I'll have it active at the very start and at the very end, but I want it to transition um, smoothly from this intro camera to our player. So at the end, I'm going to give it an ease out duration of say about a second. And you can see in our preview at the moment, um, our main camera is just going to the origin, but um, in game, this will actually transition to the player's first person camera. Let's have it feel like the player is opening their eyes as well by having the camera fade in at the start of this. We can do that with another AC track, this time camera fade. And if I just add from texture 2D, I'm going to fade in from black. With this track type, the screen is going to be this black texture whenever it's active. But like the main camera track, we can ease out of its effect by giving it an ease out duration. Lastly, let's have the player say something as part of this timeline rather than directly through an action. So I'll add one more track, this time an AC speech track. And if I select its header, I can choose that this is going to be a player line. I'll click to create a new speech playable clip. And inside its line text box, I'll give it the same speech we had earlier. So. Uh, If we go back to our on start cutscene, I'm now going to delete these actions we had before and replace it with an engine control timeline action. The director is going to be this intro timeline we've just made. We're going to play it from the beginning and I'm going to check wait until finish so that the game isn't playable while this intro is playing. Let's test everything out now. But as amazing as this little opening might be, uh, it's going to get a little bit uh, annoying to have to go through it every time we want to test out our scene. So what we can do is create another input that can be used to skip the active cutscene. Again, in our settings manager, in our available inputs box, we can find an input named end cutscene. So if we create an input named this, we can use that to skip whatever cutscene is currently running. Once again, in Edit Project Settings, I'll create a new input by increasing the size. I'll name it End Cutscene. And I'll set its positive button to Tab. So if we give this a quick test, now when we play the opening cutscene, I can press Tab and we skip through the rest of the animation. If we wanted our game to have a little bit of ambience or music tracks running in the background, we can also do that from our on start cutscene. If we right click and choose add new action and then choose uh, say sound play ambience, we then get an option to bring up the ambience storage window. And from here you can assign a new audio clip to choose as your ambience track and then play it inside this action. If I then wanted to have this play at the very beginning of our game, I could just click on this cog icon here and choose move to front, which will shunt it to the very top left. And I can click auto arrange to have our actions be arranged a bit more neatly. Let's now start making some of this scene interactive. And to make something interactive, we need to add a hotspot that covers the clickable area in the scene. 
We've got this writing board on the wall here, so let's have it so that we can uh, have the player examine it. There are a few ways to make hotspots, and I'll try to go through uh, the different ways in this tutorial. The most simple is just to go to the AC game editor uh, in the scene manager. I'll select hotspot from the list of prefabs. And if we actually have a mesh selected at the time, I can also check position over selected mesh. And then clicking add new then places this new hotspot represented by this yellow cube over the, uh, the, the board here. I'm going to name this hotspot um, hotspot colon um, uh, writing board. And if we look at in its inspector, I can set its label. This is what appears on screen as writing board. And then to make it interactive, all we need to do is create a use interaction. So if I go to the bottom here and click on the plus icon, I've now got a new use interaction and I can create an action list that will run when we click on this by clicking create beside the interaction field here. And you can see we now have a, uh, a new action list. And as with the on start cutscene, we've got a node icon beside it. So if I click on it to bring up the action list editor, I can now create the actions that make up this interaction. So I'll start with a, let's say a character face object, because we'll have the camera focus on the middle of this. So we'll have a character face object action. I'll check effect player and also effect head pitch. And the object to face will be my hotspot writing board. I'll check wait until finish so that the camera movement finishes before we continue. And then we'll have a simple dialogue play speech action in which the player says something like, um, uh, you, I don't want to know what goes on here. So we can now click on this writing board, the camera will move and the player will say something. Notice though that we can also interact with it on the other side of the room. So what we need to do is reduce the length of the hotspot raycast. We can do that in the settings manager. If I scroll down to Raycast Settings, I'll reduce the hotspot ray length to say about 1.4. I'll also do the same thing to movable ray length. We'll cover movables later, but generally it's a good idea to have this match your hotspot ray length. Let's also give a bit of life to our speech text. And if we go back to our dialog play speech action, we can insert wait tokens whenever we want to have the scrolling pause for a little moment uh, inside a, a line of speech. So maybe at the end of this first word and inside square brackets, I'll type wait colon and then the length of the wait. So I'll have just one second and let's see how we're going now. Let's also get rid of the, um, the name of the character as they speak. At the moment we have first person player appearing above all subtitles. We can do that by editing the subtitles menu inside our menu manager. If I go to the menu tab, we have a list of all of the menus that make up our game. This is just the default interface and we can create and amend any of these menus. If I go to the subtitles menu, um, clicking on any menu gives you a list of elements that make it up. And for the subtitles, we have the, uh, the subs speaker label, which is the, the name of the character speaking, and subs line label, which is the dialogue text itself. I'm going to hide the first one. So I'll select it. And then in its list of properties, I'll uncheck is visible. So we now no longer have the player's name appearing in subtitles. But it's a little bit tight there. There's not really much padding in the subtitles menu. So let's just go and edit the subtitles prefab. So any menu that makes use of Unity UI, um, as in the case of this subtitles menu, you can see the source is set to Unity UI prefab. This means that our menus display is actually controlled by a Unity UI object. And we can see the linked canvas prefab field is set to subtitles UI which is a prefab that has been generated by the new game wizard. And if I double click on that, 
We can preview it in the scene window. And so what I'm just going to select the panel, find in its inspector the vertical layout group, and I'll just give it some padding in all directions in this vertical layout group component. I also want to make it so that when we hover over a particular hotspot, then the cursor will change. We can do that by going to the Cursor Manager. And as with the default menus, our default interface comes with a selection of icons. And we can have these affect the active cursor just by checking Change Cursor based on interaction. So we can now approach the writing board. We've got the cursors changed and we've got a bit more padding on our subtitles menu. Let's now make a hotspot that gives us a bit of uh, motion to our scene. So we have this cabinet over here on the wall. And what I'm going to do is have it so that we can open and close this door uh, just by clicking on it multiple times. I'll first move this, uh, this table we have here out the way so it's a bit easier to get to. And if I click on this, we can see that it's a, uh, a cabinet prefab. I'm just going to move it out of my big hierarchy here so it's not, um, it's not deep inside my set folder. And I'll unpack it from the prefab like this uh, just because we have another cabinet over on the, the other side of the wall here. And I'll demonstrate another way to create an interaction uh, with that one. So with this method, what we're going to do is rely on animation. So before I go and start creating any hotspots, I'm going to add a animator component. And this needs a controller asset. So I'll right click and choose create animator controller named cabinet. And I'll assign that into my animator component. And with the animation tab open, we can then create a new animation clip. Um, I'll call this one uh, Cabinet Open. This will just be a one frame animation where we have our, uh, our cabinet door um, moved to the open position. And I'll do the same thing for a shut animation. So I'll name uh, Cabinet Shut and record the door in the closed position. I'll then just, uh, just tidy things up a little bit. Um, I'll make a new folder just for my cabinet animations. And then if we have a look at the cabinet animator, you'll see that we've got now our two animations here. I'm going to make the shut one the default. And to then transition between the two of them, I'm going to rely on a bool parameter. So in my parameters tab, I'll create a new bool named uh, is open. So a, a transition from shut to open based on is open being true. And for the reverse, I'll do from open to shut if is open is false. Before we go any further, let's just test this out. I'll drag the, uh, the animator window underneath the game window. And then when our game is running, um, I can just toggle this is open uh, checkbox to have our door open and close. So now what we want to do is make this interactive and make the is open toggle on and off when we click on it. Now to make this a hotspot, we need a collider and a hotspot component. Uh, before with the, the, the writing board, we added it via the scene manager, but we can also just do it in the add component menu. So with the cabinet selected, I can go to Add Component, Adventure Creator, Hotspots, and then Hotspot. I'll give it the name Cabinet and create a new Use Interaction. Similar to the, uh, the animator's Is Open parameter, we also want to create a variable that Adventure Creator can read to work out if the cabinet is open or not. There are a few ways we can add variables. Uh, for example, if we go to the AC Game Editor's Variables tab, we can create global variables that can be accessed from anywhere in the game. But for something like this, uh, we just want to have it only associated with this cabinet, and we can do that with a component variable. And to do that, we can click on Add Component, Adventure Creator, Logic, and then choose Variables. So similar to the, uh, the bool parameter, I'm going to create a new Boolean variable named isOpen. 
If we now open up the action list editor for our interaction, I'll set the first one to be a variable check action because we're going to check the value of this component variable. So I'll set the source to component and then the component will be cabinet. We've only got one variable, so it's already selected that as the variable to check. And right now it's checking to see if the Boolean is true. So if it is, we want to set it to false. And if it's false, we want to set it to true. So in the if condition is met socket, I'm going to drag out a new action that's going to be a variable set. Again, the source is going to be component and the component will be cabinet. And so it's automatically set the is open to false. And in the case that the variable is false, I can copy this action, paste it, and then link it up. And this time the variable is going to be set to true. So the next step is just to connect the is open variable to our is open animator parameter. And we can do that by looking at its properties and setting its link to value to custom script. And this allows us to connect its value to anything that we want just uh, using a script. And Adventure Creator comes with one that allows us to link it to an animator parameter. And we can get that component by choosing add component, Adventure Creator, logic, and then link variable to animator. Then we just need to give it the shared variable name, which is is open, because that's the name of both our variable and the parameter. We can optionally supply a variables and animated component, but this will default to the components that are attached to the same object. And if I now click on the cabinet, it will transition between open and closed. You might notice at the bottom left of the game window, uh, right about here, you can see that we've got this menu button that's uh, flickering off every time we use the cabinet. And that's because while this action list is running, we are momentarily uh, running a cutscene. And this menu down here, we can look in the menu manager. This is the in-game menu. And you can see in its list of properties, its appear type is set to during gameplay. And so that means that whenever it's in a cutscene, it's going to turn off. But in the case of a cabinet, we're not actually looking to interrupt gameplay. So what I can do is go to my cabinet use interaction and in the action list editor or at the top of the inspector, I can enable properties, change the when running field to run in background, and that'll just stop the game from going into cutscene mode whenever we use this cabinet. Let's now turn our attention to the main puzzle of our little uh, tutorial game. And what we're going to have is this locked door over here. And if we have a look at its hierarchy, you'll see that we've got this door parent and then two door objects. And what I'm going to do is have a little animation play whenever we try to use it while the door is locked. So we'll have, say, the, the doors rattle a little bit. As with the cabinet, I'm going to add an animator component. And actually, this time I'll make a folder for it. I'll call this, uh, this door. Inside that, create a new animator controller named door as well. And for this door, I'm only going to make one animation. Uh, I can open up the animation window. And I'll create an animation called, say, uh, door locked. And so this will be very simple. I'll just have the, um, the doors shake a little bit before settling down again. I'll also select the animation in its inspector and uncheck loop time just to make sure it doesn't do that repeatedly. In the animator window, I'm going to make a empty animation the default. So I'll right click, create staped empty, set this as the default. And then to play this door locked animation, I'm going to rely on a trigger parameter. So I'll create a new trigger parameter, named it say uh, locked shake 
and then have that trigger cause a transition from my default state to uh, this door locked animation. And when it's finished, I'll have it transition back to the empty. So with our animation now ready, we can go and create our hotspot. This time I'll do it back in the scene manager. I'll create a new hotspot, which I'll call uh, hotspot door. I'll position it over the, uh, the door like so. And in its inspector, I'll set its label to door and create a new use interaction. If we now open up the action list editor for this interaction, and inside this action list, we'll start again with the character face object action in which we'll have the player affecting head pitch, uh, facing the object hotspot door. And then we'll follow this with a object animate action. And this allows us to play back an animator directly. We first need to set an animation engine. And if you're working in 3D, then you pretty much always want to set this to mechanism. Our method is going to be change parameter value. The animator is going to be door. The parameter to effect will be locked shake, which I've entered down in my animator component. And this is a trigger, so I'll set that as the parameter type. And then we'll just have a brief wait while that animation plays. So I'll add an engine wait of about one second. Let's have the player say something about this being locked. So back in our action list editor, um, I'll make a new action. And this time it's going to be a dialogue play speech in which the player says uh, very simply locked. Now this puzzle that we're going to make isn't going to be very difficult, but let's assume that the player uh, clicks on this door a few times. Let's have a bit more variety uh, in the player's speech when we use it. If I right click and choose add new action, we can create a variable run sequence action. And this allows us to run different chains of actions each time it's run. Uh, let's set the number of possible values to say three and I'll reroute um, our engine wait action to run this one instead. If we want to save the state of this variable run sequence action, we need to save it in a variable but it's not really necessary for this case, so I'm going to uncheck save sequence value. I'll set the first option socket to uh, run our original dialogue play speech, and then I'll create a couple more for the other cases. Let's now see how we're doing. And you can see we're now getting different responses each time. So the puzzle in our game is going to involve us finding a way to unlock this door. So the next step is to make Adventure Creator aware that the door is locked. And we can do that with another variable. As before, I'll choose Add Component and then Adventure Creator, Logic and Variables. I'll create a new component variable, this time named is locked, and its initial value is true. We can then incorporate this variable into our door use action list, and at the top, in between facing the object and playing this locked shake animation, I'm going to insert a variable check action. And again, we'll be setting the source to component. And this time the component will be hotspot door. And if the variable is set to true, then I'm going to play the locked shake animation as before. For the case that the variable is false, I can drag a new action out of this bottom socket. And in this sequence, we want the player to actually change scene. So in this chain of actions, I'll have the camera fade out with a camera fade action. I'll set the type to fade out 
and I'll check wait until finish. And then to switch scene, I'll create a scene switch action. And we can set the scene either by its build index or its file name. I'll choose name and then set the name to uh, corridor. Our action list is getting a little bit cluttered now, so I can click on auto arrange to arrange everything a bit more neatly. And we can test out this scene switching by temporarily setting is locked to false. So if I run over and use it, we now switch over to the corridor scene. Now we haven't actually done anything with this scene, so we're getting this error. And we'll come back to it a little later. But for now, I'm just going to go back to my hotspot door and set its is locked value back to true. Now that we have a locked door in our scene, let's create a means of unlocking it. We don't have any keys in this room, but we do have, over on the table here, a bone saw, which we can carry as an inventory item that we can then use on the door. Just before I go and make any of this interactive though, I've noticed that the bone saw prefab uh, has a scale of 0.01, .01, and I'm going to correct this so it has a unit scale in all directions. I'll do this with the prefab, so I'll select the bone saw prefab, and then set the scale to uh, 1, 1, and 1. And it's not going to look right in the scene until I correct the model as well. So I'll just click on the bone saw mesh and set the scale factor to 0.01. And the scale also just needs reverting in its local inspector. So we can now make this a hotspot, again by adding a first a box collider. I'll make this a little bit bigger so that we have a bigger interactive space to work with. I'll check is trigger because I don't want it to affect collision. And then we'll add a hotspot component. And I can also just type in hotspot like so, and then I'll give it the name bone saw. Then I'll create a new use interaction. And as part of this action list, I can go to inventory, add or remove. And we're then getting a message saying no inventory items exist. So let's go and create one now. In the AC Game Editor's Inventory Manager, we can keep track of any items that the player can carry. I'll click on Create New Item, and then name this new item Bone Saw. If we want it to be represented by an icon in a menu, we can assign some graphics here. I've actually gone ahead and taken some screenshots of this item um, in my My Cool Game folder. I've got an Items directory, where I've got a couple of screenshots that I've edited in Photoshop. So I can assign these in my inventory manager. Its main graphic is going to be how it's displayed by default in a menu. So I'll assign just the, the regular bone saw texture there. And the active graphic is however it's displayed when it's being highlighted or used by the player. So I'll assign a graphic that has a, uh, a white outline around it. You can now see in our action list, our inventory add or remove action has now the option to add the bone saw. As well as adding the item to our inventory, we're also going to need to hide this model from our scene. There are a couple of ways we can do this. The first is to uh, use the object add or remove action to simply delete the object from the scene. But the difficulty with that is that we then have to uh, record the presence of that object in the scene. And normally it's a lot easier to just hide it from view. So what we can do instead is use an object teleport action the object to move is going to be my bone saw. And we then need to supply a marker to teleport it to. And a marker is similar to the player start in that it's just an arrow in our 3D scene. I can go back to the scene manager and select marker to create a new one. And I'll call this off screen marker. And then I'll just move it somewhere out of the way. I can then assign this in the object teleport action. In order for the player to know what items they're carrying, we're going to need to make use of an inventory menu. Our default interface comes with a inventory menu. And if I have a look at the inventory prefab, 
you can see that by default it's a list of items at the top of the screen. And the menu's default appear type is set to mouse over. So what we'd have to do is um, have the cursor move up to the top of the screen to then see the list of items. We'll create a proper custom inventory later on, but for now I'm just going to set the appear type to during gameplay so that we don't have to worry about the cursor's position. If we now test our progress, we can see the inventory bar at the top, and if I click on the bone saw, it's removed from the scene and we can see it listed in our inventory bar. Let's make this bone saw a little bit more dynamic so that when we click on it, it zooms in towards the player just underneath the camera. To do that, we can create an object transform action, and this action requires a movable component. We can just add this component to our bone saw by going to Add Component, Adventure Creator, MISC, and then Movable. We want it to move just underneath the camera, so we're going to need to use a marker as a position reference. So I'm going to choose Copy Marker, and we then need to make another marker that's attached to the player. If I drop our player prefab into the scene, and then add a new marker, I'll name this um, item take marker, and I'll make it a child of our player prefab. I'll move it up and just behind our camera, and then we can go back to our action list editor and assign item take marker as the marker we want to move to. I want it to act in world space and have a transition time of, say, a second. And then only once it's finished will we have the object teleport away. So I'll reroute our first action to this one and then have the object teleport action run after the transform. Now that we're involving this item take marker, which is part of our player, I'm going to leave the first person player in our scene. I think we can make the effect a little bit faster. So I'll make the transition time, uh, say, about 0.4 seconds, and I'll set the motion to smooth as well. So now that we have an item in our inventory, let's make it so that we can use it on the door. In order to access the inventory, we need to be able to move the cursor. At the beginning of this tutorial, we've checked Lock Cursor in Screen Center when game begins. Again, we'll be working on a proper inventory system later on, but for now we're just going to have an input that we can press to toggle between the cursor being locked and unlocked. Further down the settings manager we have our available inputs, and we have an input named toggle cursor. So I'm going to create a new input, this time named toggle cursor. And I'll set the positive button to uh, left control. So whenever I press control, I can now access the inventory. And we can select our bone saw by clicking on it. To have this item then be something we can use on the door, we need to create a new inventory interaction for that hotspot. So I'll select the hotspot door, and in its inspector, I'll create the plus icon beside Inventory Interactions, and here I can create an interaction for the Bone Saw. So this action list is going to run whenever we use the Bone Saw on the door, and as before we'll start very simple. We'll start by removing the item from the inventory, so we'll have an Inventory Add or Remove action. This time the method will be Remove, and we'll be removing the Bone Saw. Next we'll unlock the door, by having a variable set action, the source is component, the component is hotspot door, and we're going to be setting is locked to false. As with picking up the bone saw, let's add a bit of motion to this, and what we can do is add a little animation where we see the bone saw um, uh, go through in between the two doors here to unlock it. I'm going to work with the uh, this door animator that we've got. And the hotspot is kind of getting in the way here, so I'm going to just temporarily hide it 
by going to the Scene Manager and then unchecking the Hotspots Visibility box. So going back to the door, I'm going to first add an instance of the Bonesaw Prefab to it. So in my uh, Morgue Room PBR folder, I can go to Prefabs and let's try, it must be in Props. I'll drag Bonesaw in like this and let's just move it over so that it's roughly in front of the door. But then I'm going to uncheck its mesh renderer so that we can turn it back on through animation. If I select the door and make another animation now, I'll make a new animation which I'll call, uh, say, door unlock. And in that, I'll enable the mesh renderer component of the bone saw, and then just make a very simple animation of the uh, of it going in. Maybe make the time a little bit longer. And then inside the animator, I need to create a transition for it. So I'm going to create a trigger called unlock. And we'll use that to run this door unlock animation. And then when it's finished, we'll have it transition back. Uh, but I'll get rid of any transition duration. We can then play that animation back inside our door bone saw action list by creating a new object animate action. Again, we'll use the mechanim animation engine. The animator will be our door. We'll change the parameter unlock. This is going to be a trigger. And then we'll have a cutscene of about two seconds. So I'll add an engine weight of two. Now we have a door that we can unlock. Let's create the transition to the second scene. Our hotspot door action list already has a scene switch action, but the corridor scene that it switches to isn't yet set up to be an AC scene. If we open up the corridor scene, we can then click again inside the scene manager and choose to organize the scene. Again, I'll do it without folders and we'll have a player start. This is our default player start appearing in the origin of the scene. I'm going to move this into the middle of the room. I'll also put the, the visuals of this scene into a subfolder. So just quickly uh, make a new game object and parent all of these objects to it. Let's see what happens now when we go from the morgue into the corridor. You can see that we're now playing in the corridor scene, but we're appearing in the middle of the room. And that's because that's where we placed the default player start. And this is where the player will be positioned unless it has anywhere better to go to. Loading up the corridor scene again, what we can do is create another player start that will have the player appear in front of the doors if they've come from our morgue scene. Our default player start is just named player start. So to avoid confusion, I'll name this uh, player start colon default. And then I'll create a new one by going to the game editor, scene manager, and then clicking on player start. I'll name this one player start uh, morgue. And I'll move it so that it's in front of the doors. The player start also affects rotation, so I'll turn it around like this. And then taking a look at the player start component, we have this previous scene activation panel. 
and these are the details for the scene that we've come from for it to work. I'll set choose scene by to name and then type in the name of our previous scene which is morgue. Since we're making a first person game we don't need to worry about having a special camera on start but if we were making a third person game we could assign the camera here. For the return journey I'll make another hotspot over these doors so I'll go to the scene manager create a new hotspot Position it over the doors. I'll just name this uh, hotspot colon door. Set its label to door. And in its use interaction, I'll just give it a single scene switch back to the morgue scene. Finally, we can create one more player start in the morgue scene coming from this corridor. So back in the morgue scene, I'll create another player start. name it player start corridor and just as with the other one I need to set its previous scene details so this time the name is going to be corridor. The last thing we need to be aware of is the on start cutscene of this morgue scene. If we have a look at our on start cutscene you can see that we're playing our introductory timeline we don't want this to run when we're coming from the morgue scene, so what we're going to do is check that we're starting the game in this scene. I can do that with a scene check action. I'll check that the previous scene has a name of nothing. And if we start the game from this scene, that condition will be true, in which case I want to run the engine control timeline action. And if not, I'll stop the action list here. I'll make this action run first by choosing move to front or to arrange. One other gotcha we need to be aware of is that the intro timeline needs to have its play on a week checkbox unchecked and that will make sure that it's only ever run through this action. If we then test out our scene transitions we can pass through the doors to the corridor. We appear in front of the doors in the correct player start. I can turn around, go through the door and finally I'm on the other side of the doors in the morgue scene. After we come back from the corridor into the morgue scene again, you'll see that the scene has actually been reset. If we try to use the doors, they're locked again. And if we go over to the table, the saw is still there. And that's because Adventure Creator's save system works by us telling Adventure Creator which objects we want to save. And that's a case of just adding the right components to them. If we start with this bone saw, when we take it we have the object be moved towards the camera. And so its position in its transform component is changing. So that's what we want to have saved. We can do this by going to Add Component, Adventure Creator, Save System, and then you'll see all of the Remember components that are used to save different parts. I'm going to choose Remember Transform because it's the transform component of this object that we want to save. In terms of the door, what we want to save this time are the variables because we want to save the state of this is locked boolean. So this time I can go to Add Component and choose Adventure Creator, Save System, and then Remember Variables. And if I now save the scene, return from the corridor to the morgue, you'll see that the locked state of the door is now saved and the bone saw is no longer on the table. This act of adding remember components to objects can also be automated. We can do that by going to the AC game editor and then settings manager and then click auto add save components to game objects. If I click this we'll then get a prompt to uh, just confirm that we want to do this I'll choose OK and then it's gone through all of our scenes in the build settings and gone in and added the right remember components. With that step complete it also means that we can make use of Adventure Creator's save system. While we're playing the game using the default interface we can access the pause menu either by unlocking the cursor 
and clicking on the lower left, or just by pressing Escape. And from this pause menu, we can access the Save and Load buttons, which bring up the Save and Load menus that we can use to access our save game files. Something that's quite common in first-person adventure games is to have the player make a choice by choosing from a list of on-screen options. For example, when clicking on this bone saw, they might be asked, are we sure we want to take it? And then we can choose either yes or no to confirm. We can do that in Adventure Creator using the conversation system. Conversations are mainly used uh, for NPC dialogue options, but they can be used for really any kind of on-screen choice presented to the player. We can create a conversation from the scene manager. I'll create a new conversation and this one is just going to have the options yes and no. So I'll actually name this object conversation uh, yes slash no. In its inspector I can click add new option to create a new option. I'll set this options label to yes and then I'll create another one called No. Underneath are some more properties to do with display and so on, but we can ignore those in favour of just creating our conversation as part of the interaction itself. If I click on our bone saw and find the bone saw use interaction, you can see that we begin by adding the bone saw item to our inventory straight away. So before we run any of these, we're going to have the player given a choice. I'll begin by having a dialogue play speech action in which the player says something like Looks like a saw. Should I take it? And then we'll bring up the yes no choices by creating a dialogue start conversation action in which our conversation is conversation yes, no. And if I check override options, we can set the behavior of what happens when we click either of those options inside of this action list. So if the player chooses yes, we're going to add the item to our inventory as normal. And if we choose no, we're not going to do anything. We then just need to have this dialog play speech action run first. So I'll click the cog icon choose Move to Front, and then I'll tidy things up by clicking Auto Arrange. You can see that when these options appear, we also have this, this slider down at the bottom. Conversations can optionally be given a time limit, and so this slider is used to represent how long we might have left. Since our conversation isn't going to be timed, let's remove that. And we can do that by going to the Menu Manager, and finding the conversation menu. And if we scroll down to find its list of elements, you can see we have the dialogue list, which is the list of options, and then dialogue timer, which is the slider that was appearing underneath. I'll just uncheck is visible. And then if we rerun the conversation, that will no longer appear. One of the benefits of first-person adventure games is that they allow for the manipulation of close-up objects and moving things around as though they were really there. A little earlier, we made this cabinet interactive so that each time we click on it, it opens and then shuts one of the doors. We have another such cabinet on the other side of the room, and this time we're going to make this a draggable so that the player can click and drag uh, this draw to open and shut it, to make it feel a lot more realistic and give our game some feeling of presence. This cabinet is also a prefab, so I'm going to drag it into the, uh, the root of the scene so it's easy to get to. I'll rename this uh, Cabinet Draggable and detach it from the prefab by going to Prefab, Unpack Completely. We're going to be moving this left door here. So the first thing I'm going to do is move it to its closed position. And then just like with hotspots, it's going to need a collider of its own. So I'll go to add component and add a box collider. 
And just like with hotspots, it's going to be interactive on the default layer. Now I want to make sure that the cabinet itself doesn't get in the way. So going to the root cabinet draggable object, I'll set this layer to ignore raycast. And then know this object only. To make this door a draggable, I need to add the drag component. And I can do that by choosing add component, adventure creator, misc, and then draggable. This is a complex feature, so it's got a complex inspector to match. But the main thing we want to look at first is this drag settings panel. And inside that, the drag mode field. And this determines how the object is manipulated. This is set to lock to track, which is what we want. And a track is a predefined um, path that the object can take. And so you can see underneath, we have a track to stick to that we're going to need to assign. Since this door can only move uh, in a straight line, we're going to add a straight track. We can do that by going to the Scene Manager, and underneath the Movable panel, I'll click on Straight Track. I'll make this a child of our cabinet, and then I'll need to position it so that it's at the same place as this door when it's closed. So this door is already in the right place and we want the track to be in the same place. If I go to the top of the doors inspector, I can just copy its transform component, then select the track and paste those component values. It's best to work with a unit scale. So while our door has a scale of 0.01, I'm going to put the track back up to one. You can see that our track um, is represented by this straight line with two circles at either end. And this represents the path of the track. I'm going to rotate this down 90 degrees and then drag this end gizmo, which represents the end of the track, and reduce its length. Uh, I can see in this inspector, maybe 0.55. We also want to take note of the track's movement input field. This is set to drag vector, which means when we um, manipulate an object on that track, its speed will be determined by how quickly we're moving the mouse. I'm going to set this to cursor position, which means it'll instead be based on where my mouse is. Um, it is a subtle difference. It is typically better for objects that are viewed at um, a kind of a fixed angle or a, a limited range of angles. With the track configured, let's go back to our draggable component and assign it as the track to stick to. And let's ignore the other fields and just see how this is going. So you can see I can now click on the draw and moving left and right slides it open and shut. There's a few things we can do to uh, improve usability. First of all, we can prevent free aiming while we're dragging something. We can do that in the AC Game Editor, Settings Manager, and then scrolling down to Interface Settings, I'll check Disable Free Aim when moving draggables. We can also have an icon appear when we're dragging something. If we go back to the draggable component, underneath Icon Settings, I'll check Icon at Contact Point. It'll default to the Use Cursor, and that's fine. And lastly, we want to have the name of this cabinet appear when we mouse over it to let us know that it's interactive. We can do that using a hotspot component. So if I just create a new hotspot, give it the label uh, cabinet, but I'll leave all the interaction fields alone so that the hotspot doesn't actually do anything other than display its name. Having made this cabinet a draggable object, let's do something similar to these drawers we have over here. These are going to follow the same principle, but are a little bit more complicated because we involve rotations. All of these drawers are copies of the same prefab, so I'm going to select this original prefab and open it up in prefab mode so that we can change all of them at the same time. This prefab has a door object, and it's this door we're going to open and close. 
Its position is around its hinge, and this is where we're going to place the hinge track. So with this door selected, I'm going to copy the transform component because I want to copy its position. And then in the AC game editor, I'll create a new hinge track and give it the same position as this door. I'll just reset the scale as well. If we zoom out, we can uh, make sense of this track a little bit better. Um, you can see this time it's a curved line with the gray circle representing the closed position. So if I rotate this down 90 degrees so that we have a rotation of 90, 0, 0, I'll just bring the radius down and maybe the gizmo size. And now we can start to see the, the motion that we want this door to have. I can increase the maximum angle to say 100 degrees. And I'll also set the movement input again to cursor position. We'll need to make a note of this hinge tracks rotation because this should be the same rotation as the draggable object when it's in its closed position. So we have our door here and when it's closed we want it to have a rotation of 90, 0, 0. You can see that it doesn't have that at the moment and if I type that in it causes the door to flip upwards. If we were working on our own models we could just update this model but since we're working with another asset what I'll do is create a separate object for our draggable and then parent this to that. So I can go to game object create empty I'll name this uh, door and I want this to have the same transform values as our hinge track so I'll select the hinge track copy its transform component and then back in the door I'll paste those component values. I can now parent this model to our new door object and then it's just a case of converting this door into a draggable. So I'll start by going to add component adventure creator misc and then draggable we're going to lock it to the track and the track to stick to is going to be our hinge track. I'll check icon at contact point. And so that its name comes up, I'll also add a hotspot component. And finally, we just need a box collider on this same object. So I'll add the component box collider and then edit its points by clicking edit collider and then just updating its size so that it roughly matches the size of the door. And with that done, I can come out of prefab mode and you'll see we have a couple of these doors. Uh, these are the ones that were open to begin with. These have now been given wrong rotations. So what I'll do is select the door model and just revert the changes made to its position and rotation. I'll do that for both models. And if we want to have these uh, be open when the game begins, I can just go to their respective draggable components and update the initial distance along slider to uh, somewhere close to one for that one. And I'll do the other one, say about 0.7. And if we now run the scene, those doors are back open. And for all of these doors, we can open and shut them using the draggable system. Another trend of first-person adventure games is to have objects that the player can pick up and manipulate, not as an inventory item, but just something that they can pick up and rotate to get a better look at. This morgue scene has a photograph on its table over here, and I'll use this to demonstrate a couple of ways that we can add such behaviour. I'll move it a little bit closer to the front of the desk, and then duplicate it. For the first one, we're going to use an Adventure Creator pickup component. I'll start by adding a mesh collider, checking convex so that it covers the whole volume of the mesh, and then I'll add the component Adventure Creator, misc, and then pickup. This also takes a rigid body and it's added one for us automatically. Like the draggable component, there are a lot of values associated with this, but I'll leave most of them as their defaults and just check Ignore Player's Collision. Let's test out how this works. 
And if we run the scene, I can approach this photo. And if I click and drag, I'm then able to pick it up and move it around the scene. There is a bit of jittering involving Unity's physics system. And we can start by setting the rigid body's interpolation to interpolate. And if we go into the project settings and then click time, we can reduce the fixed time step to say 0 0.005 to increase the number of calculations it performs and generally keep things more smooth. If we want to be able to rotate this pickup while we're holding it, we can do that by checking allow rotation. And then you can see at the bottom, we then get a prompt to define an input named rotate movable. And if we hold that down while we're dragging the pickup, we'll be able to rotate it as well. But let's take a look at the other photo. And with this one, we're going to keep the camera locked in place so that we're able to rotate automatically as we drag the cursor around. I'm going to add another mesh collider component and instead of a pickup, I'll add a draggable. This time I'll set its drag mode to rotate only and the presence of a rigid body is optional. I'll also add the component hotspot and then set that label to photo. So if we test this one out, we'll see that we can click and then drag to update its rotation. The problem here is obviously that it's not changing its position and is able to clip through the table. What would be best is to have the object zoom in towards the camera whenever it's held by the player. We can do that by using a custom script and such a script is available on the Adventure Creator Community Wiki. The Community Wiki is a repository for, for all kinds of add-on and integration scripts, and if you're interested in extending Adventure Creator, it's a great place to start. We can access the wiki by going to Adventure Creator up at the top toolbar, choosing Online Resources, and then Community Wiki. And on the front page, I'll choose General Tips and Tricks, and if we scroll down, we can find under R, return pickups to original position. I can copy the code on this page and it's named return pickup. So inside my games folder, I'll create a new C -sharp script named return pickup. And copy paste the contents of that code inside it. To use it, I can then just click on the photo frame again, and this time add the component return pickup. And you can see that the inspector needs a couple of fields. It has a move speed, which we can probably leave at its default, and we have a marker when held field. And this refers to the marker that this photo should zoom towards whenever we hold it. We did something similar to this when we updated our first person player with item take marker, so we'll do the same thing here. In the AC Game Editor's C Manager, I'll create a new marker, parent it to my first person player, and this time I'll position it so that it's a little bit in front of the camera. In fact, I'll actually parent it to the first person camera and have it so that it's just in front of the camera, uh, maybe a little bit further away. I'll name this um, Item Zoom Marker. And then going back to my photo, and I'll assign this as the marker when held. If we run the scene, we can test out its behavior. And if I now hold the mouse button over the photo, you'll see that we can pick it up. It zooms towards the camera, we can rotate it, and when I release the click, it goes back to its original position. We can have the player make a comment when picking something up by defining an interaction on grab in the draggable inspector. I can click create beside it, and then we get this interaction that is going to be run each time the object is picked up. I can set this to, for example, a dialogue play speech action in which the player says something like, looks like a good boy. 
And this isn't going to be a cutscene, we still want the player to be able to rotate the object as this speech is being played. So I'll go to the properties of this action list and set its when running field to run in background. Let's take a look at our inventory UI, which could do with a bit of improving. We have this big, um, this big inventory bar showing at all times, and it's taking up quite a lot of the screen space. And in order to access it, we need to press the toggle cursor input to be able to move the mouse up to the top so that we can then select an item. Let's create a new inventory menu that only turns on when we want it to, and we'll also unlock the cursor automatically. We're going to create a new inventory menu from scratch, so I'm going to delete the old one. In the AC Game Editor's Menu Manager, I can select the inventory menu, click the cog beside it, and choose Delete. We'll come back here when we're ready to create our new menu, but for now we're just going to focus on the UI canvas itself. I'm going to go into 2D mode in my scene window, and then create a new game object, UI, and then canvas. And I'm going to name this canvas uh, New Inventory UI. If I zoom out to see the whole thing, we now need to create the boundary of this menu. I'm going to keep this menu's looking fairly simple, so I'm just going to use an image component. Game object, UI image, and I'll name this um, panel. I'll set the width and height of this to 250 and make sure it's in the very middle. Make it a little bit darker and maybe drop the alpha a little bit. Each of our inventory slots is going to appear in a grid, so I'm going to add a new child object named grid and then add the component grid layout group. Our cell size is going to be 70 for both and I'll increase the size of this rec transform so that it mostly covers the panel. For each item slot, I can now just create a button. So I'll go to game object, UI, button. And if I parent this to my grid object, it'll appear in the correct place with the correct size. We'll have our item names appear in the hotspot menu, just as we do with regular hotspots. So we don't need a text object. And now I'll just duplicate this button eight times so that we have nine objects. And I'll just tweak the position of this grid object as well. Our UI is going to be spawned in at runtime, so we're going to need to make this a prefab. I'll drag this new inventory UI object into my UI folder, and then I'll delete both it and the event system, which Unity has added in from the scene. We can now start to configure our menu in the Menu Manager. So if I go back to Adventure Creator's Menu Manager, I'll click Create New Menu, and I'll name this Inventory. You can see from our list of menus, it's right at the bottom. And what we're going to need to do is just move it up one. I'll click on this cog icon, rearrange, and move up. And the reason for that is that we want the hotspot menu to be below. And that's because menus are processed in the order that they're listed here. And our hotspot menu is going to be dependent on our inventory because we want it to pick up the names of inventory items that we're hovering over. Back in this menu's properties, I'll set the source to Unity UI Prefab. And further down the bottom, we've got a linked canvas prefab field. I'll drop in the new inventory UI Prefab. And you can see we also have a rect transform boundary field. And this should be assigned to a rec transform that represents the visible area of the menu. If we open up our prefab, you can see that we have that with the panel object. So while we're in prefab mode, I can just drag in the panel object into this rect transform boundary field. You can see that we've now got a recorded constant ID number, and that allows Adventure Creator to connect with the scene instance of this prefab at runtime. 
If we go to the inspector, you can see we now have a constant ID component. This is all handled automatically, so we're good to just leave this alone. Going back to the menu manager, we can now take a look at the menus elements panel. We only need a list of inventory items, so we're going to set the element type to inventory box and then add new. And if we have a look at the properties for this, our inventory box type will leave as default. The maximum number of slots are set to nine. And you can see we have nine fields to represent each of the nine buttons that make up our UI. So I'm going to assign these from the UI prefab one by one. And as I'm doing so, you can see the constant ID values are being set as well. Before we go and test this, we just need to change a couple more properties. Our menus appear type is currently set to manual, whereas what we want to do is have it whenever the user presses an input key. So I'm going to choose on input key, and we then need to type in a key. I'll set this to toggle inventory, and then I'll define this in Unity's input manager. Edit, project settings, and then input manager. And rather than create a new one, I'm just going to rename toggle cursor because the inventory turning on will handle that for us. I'll check pause game when enabled, and this will prevent the player from being able to move around and free aim while this is open, and it'll also unlock the cursor. For a bit of smoothness, we can also set a transition type. I'll choose canvas group fade, and we can then set a transition time. I'll just choose, say, 0.2 seconds, and we'll get an info message just saying that we need to add a canvas group to the route. So on this new inventory UI prefabs route, I'll just add the component canvas group. We can now exit prefab mode and test our game. I can press the toggle inventory input to see the inventory I'm holding now, and I can click on it to select it. As one last bit of polish, we can see that if we open up the pause menu and then press the toggle inventory input, we can access the inventory menu from here. And it might be more intuitive to only have this menu be available while we're in regular gameplay. Our menu right now turns on whenever we press the toggle inventory input because the appear type is set to on input key. If we instead set this to manual, then we can turn this menu on and off by using actions instead. We can have an action list that runs whenever we press a particular input by defining what Adventure Creator calls an active input. If we go up to the top toolbar and choose Adventure Creator, Editors, and then Active Inputs Editor, I can create a new active input. And if I look at the properties for this, I'll set the label to Turn on, turn on Inventory. and I'll click Create to define an action list that runs when it's triggered. You can see we have this available when game is, and it's currently set to normal, which means this action list will only run if we press the toggle inventory input during gameplay. Inside this action list, I can use a menu change state action to turn on the inventory menu. We'll also need to create another active input to handle turning off the menu. So I'll create a new one, name it Turn Off Inventory. Again, its input button is going to be Toggle Inventory. This time it's going to be available when the game is paused. And that's because our menu pauses the game when it's turned on. I can click to create a new active input. And just as with the other action list, this is going to be a menu change state. I'll set the change type to turn off menu, and the menu to turn off will be inventory. And I'll check transition as well, both to this and the other action list. So if we now run our game, we can now only open our inventory menu when we're in gameplay. We can't do it when we're in pause mode, or in a cutscene. 
that menu is a little bit more intuitive. Another type of interaction that's common to first-person adventure games is the ability to have a close-up sequence where uh, the player is kind of locked in view and is still free to interact with hotspots but can't move the camera or themselves. We have some jars over on this shelf over here that we can demonstrate this with. First I'll just remove this table because it's kind of getting in the way and I'll also turn back hotspot visibility. We want to make it so that clicking anywhere around these jars activates this close-up. So let's create a new hotspot. I'll name hotspot uh, jars. And I'll position it so that it covers all three of the jars on the shelf. When we click on this hotspot, we're going to switch to a new close-up camera. And to do that, we can create a new simple camera in our scene manager. I'll name this uh, simple camera jars. And I'll move it so that it's just in front of the jars, so that we have a clear view of all three of them. So going back to my hotspot jars, hotspot component, I'll set the label to jars create a new use interaction and inside it use a camera switch action in which we switch to the simple camera jars camera with a transition time of say half a second and wait until finish. It's also important to bear in mind that when we're in a first person game Adventure Creator will automatically switch back to the first person camera whenever we leave a cutscene. So what we need to do is tell Adventure Creator that as part of this close-up, we don't want to be in first person. We can do that by adding an additional Engine Manage Systems action, and we can check Change Movement Method, in which we change the movement method to None. Now we can start to make some of these individual jars interactive. I can hide this hotspot's yellow gizmo by unchecking draw yellow cube and then I can click on say this jar over here to make it interactive. I'll add the component uh, box collider as well as a hotspot component and I'll give it the name jar. Our use interaction can be just a simple uh, dialogue play speech action But we also want to make sure that we can only click on this jar while we're in a close-up. And we can do that by going to its limit to camera field and setting this to our close-up camera. And in the same way, we can also make it so that we can only click on this wider close-up hotspot when we're in first person by going to the hotspots component and setting its limit to camera to the player's first person camera. In order to exit the close-up, we'll then need to switch the camera back to first person and enable first person movement again. The way we'll do that here is to have a menu appear in the lower right corner. If we go back to the AC Game Editor's menu manager, I'll create a new menu named, say, close-up. And to demonstrate the other source option for menus, I'll leave it as Adventure Creator which means that we can actually preview it in the game window. So if I create a new button, for example, we've now got the button element appearing uh, in this preview. I can give it a background texture. I'll name this button exit. And the same for the button text. I'll also set its position to aligned and align it in the lower right. Uh, maybe make the font a little bit bigger and give it a, uh, a green highlight texture so that we know when we're hovering over it. We'll leave the button's click type as run action list and then click on create to define an action list to run. In this action list we're going to switch back to first person movement and also re-enable the first person camera. So we can start with an engine manage systems action 
change the movement method back to first person, and then use a camera switch action to return to the last gameplay camera, which will be first person, and give it a transition time of half a second, and I'll check wait to finish as well. We want to have this menu only appear during gameplay, so in the menu's properties I can set its appear type to during gameplay. We don't want it to show all the time though, only uh, when we're in a close-up, so I'm going to check start game locked off, and then we can unlock it when we begin our close-up. So if we go back to our hotspot jars' interaction, I'll add a menu change state action in which the change type is going to be unlock menu, and I'll unlock the close up menu, and then we'll lock this again when we exit the close up. So I'll go back to my close up exit on click action list, and similarly add a menu change state in which we lock the close up menu again. So I can walk up to the jars, I can click on the jars hotspot, and then we get the option to click on this individual jar. And if I click on exit, we'll revert back to first person. One other gotcha to be aware of in this situation is that if we go back to the AC Game Editor's settings manager, you can see that our movement method is currently set to none, and that's while we're in the close up. If we exit play mode, you can see that this is still set, and that's because any change to our settings manager or any manager field will survive play mode. So to make sure that we always begin the game with the right movement setting, we're going to initialize everything when the game begins. Just a little further up, we have cutscene settings and this action list on start game field. I'll create that, and then inside this, I'm just going to add one more engine manage systems action in which we change the movement method to first person and you can see here we're set to none but if I run the game it'll switch back to first person and we can play the game as normal. Well that about wraps it up for this tutorial. I did try to strike a balance between being manageable in length and also covering a wide range of topics but if you find yourself in need of more you can access all of Adventure Creator's text and video tutorials by going to the top toolbar, choosing Adventure Creator, Online Resources, and then Tutorials.